One team that had themselves a quiet Thursday night was the New York Knicks, but I think it could be a loud offseason at the Garden. To help us break that down is CP, the franchise, the creator of Knicks TV. CP, thanks for joining us here on Betting Above the Rim. Kevin, good to be on with you. Uh, Knicks Fan TV, just a quick correction, but good to be on with you, man. Good morning. You got it. You got it, man. Awesome. Yeah, my bad on that. Uh, but look, he, he, you know, the, the Knicks were, again, no prospects drafted, right? There are a couple of guys that they picked up, and, and maybe we'll get to them. But the Knicks, a, a part of the rumor mill, specifically with an eye on Paul George. Now, yeah. there seems to be some hesitation from the Knicks if they really want to push in on that type of move what are your thoughts on the potential for Paul George landing in Madison Square Garden yeah well it seems like where the Clippers are right now that Paul George could be on the market it seems like they're trying to gauge the trade market for a Paul George obviously the four-year investment that they made in Paul George and Kawhi Leonard hasn't panned out I mean these two guys together have won 68 percent of their games but uh it's very rare that they are together Paul George only playing 56 games last year but he's still an all-star uh for the Knicks a guy like a Paul George a two-way big wing scorer is something that they've been missing for years and so you like the type of player that he is and it's certainly intriguing but there's so much downside risk he's 33 years old two years left on his deal you have to think that he's looking for one more big payday before the sun sets and then his injury history i mean the guy is never on the court and so for the knicks Mm -hmm. they have to think if they are engaging with the clippers what is the price that they are willing to pay for what could be a two-year rental on a Paul George? If I were them, I'd be very hesitant to give up a young talent like an R.J. Barrett, even an Emmanuel Quickly, or even a Quentin Grimes, because this would be such a short-term experiment. But nevertheless, he can certainly help. So let me know, on the idea that it would be short-term, how willing would you be to extend Paul George and, and give him what he probably wants, which would be a near, you know, probably four-year type of max contract situation. Yeah, there, there's no way I'm giving a, a injury-prone Paul George at 35 um, another four-year deal to take him into 39. That would be terrible, terrible uh, asset management by the Knicks. Now, if they're able to, to uh, engage with the Clippers and, and get him for some draft capital, some salary filler, which they have, then certainly mm-hmm. you need to listen because he is a talent. But to be able to, to have to mortgage your future with one or two picks and plus salary, plus uh draft capital that's a lot for an aging veteran who you know is on the downside of his career if i were the knicks if i'm going to make that type of investment there, there are a lot of guys out there with injury risk but younger guys i would even look at a zach levine i would gauge uh the pelicans interest in trading even a zion williamson if you're going to go that route but for a 33 year old paul george to then take him into a contract at 39 uh, i wouldn't take that risk what I would say and why what I imagine is is difficult though for the Knicks to balance in this situation CP unless you disagree but he's a perfect fit because yeah. Paul George is a perfect fit on any roster you put him in he is a guy that can get his he can space the floor and he can play high level defense there there he can play two through four whatever you want to do whether you want to go big you want to go small and I I would imagine in the room for the Knicks, who again, you know, we were talking before we got going here, I thought had had themselves a really successful season, 47 wins, and the way they dominated Cleveland in the opening round, getting to that next level could require a talent like Paul George, and he sat right there. It has to be tempting. It's it's very tempting, man. And like you said, especially where they finished two games short of an Eastern Conference yeah. Finals, an exceptional year for the New York Knicks. When you look at, you know, Vegas had them penciled in at 39, 40, 41 wins. They won 48 games last year. They yeah. beat the Cavs in five games, a gentleman sweep being the fifth seed and then coming up against the Miami Heat. And as you said, positionally, they don't have any true wings on this team they don't have wing versatility on this team as much as i like a guy like a josh hart as much as i like quentin grimes those guys are often undersized against some of the top wings in the east and the west rj barrett his defense although it it picked up later on in the postseason throughout the regular season he took a step back and so they truly need a two-way wing paul george as you said it's very tempting but it's at the right price 
that is the question. What is the price that uh, that you know the Knicks would have to pay? Because I, I said this on my show a, a few days ago when the Clippers and the Celtics had that framework in place to send Malcolm Brogdon to the Clippers, it signaled to me that they were looking for a depth piece to continue mm-hmm. in their title window. So for me, if they're going to go out there and now trade a Paul George, you're going to have to get equal or comparable value back or bring back a young player so Steve Ballmer can say, hey, you know, we're building the new stadium in Inglewood. Here's our new young piece that we're going to build around. Here's our future. Or here's another all-star. Maybe it's Julius Randle that we can put with Kawhi Leonard. It's got to be something mm-hmm. like that. I would have to think they want something substantial right now for Paul George. Which is part of the reason why, and I won't, you know, I think they should be listening on trading Kawhi maybe more than anything because I think Kawhi, due to his ceiling, might get a bigger return, pair whatever that return would be next to kind of Paul George and and see how that goes. But you mentioned something key there, and I did want to ask you about this, about the price, right? Because the PG price, we're not positive on what it exactly is. The Bradley Beal thing has since played out. He's in Phoenix, and I know the no-trade clause absolutely complicated things. But when you see what he was ultimately traded for, which is a bunch of swaps and a bunch of second-rounders and realistically nothing else, are you okay that the Knicks weren't involved more in the Bradley Beal sweepstakes? I love the talent of Bradley Beal, but the no trade clause pretty much uh, sunk their chances. From what we heard, they were very much interested in in acquiring Bradley Beal, but it seems like it was a one team race with the Phoenix Suns uh, trading with the with the yeah. Washington Wizards. And you know, you look at the return; it was a, a bunch of pick swaps, but they were able to flip CP3 into a Jordan Poole. And so, you know, you have a young talent there that can go there to Washington and showcase himself. I would have loved to see the Knicks you know, make an attempt, but with a no trade clause, you really didn't have no choice. Yeah, I just, I guess one thing that the world where Bradley Beal would be like, no, I'm good on playing in the garden. I don't like Bradley Beal has no right to say, no, I don't want to play for the New York Knicks is kind of just the way I feel about it, CP. Uh, yeah. Now, you also mentioned another interesting idea, which is if. The Clippers ask for Julius Randle. What would the Knicks do? Don't focus in as much on the idea of Julius for Paul George, but the idea of moving off of Julius Randle, who has had a very, very odd three seasons, I feel like, these past three years. We had two absolute all-star years, but then we get to the playoffs, and he's just not the same guy. How do you feel about Julius Randle moving forward with the New York Knicks? Well, where they finished, you you have to expect that Julius Randle is going to be back with this team. Unless they're getting comparable value on a trade or getting better, I don't see the Knicks just moving off of Julius Randle and kind of resetting a little bit around Jalen Brunson. Uh, Those two guys were were very much accountable to bringing this Knicks team to the playoffs again, to that second round, winning 48 games, Julius Randle having an all-star season. Uh, The two of those guys, at times, showing some very good chemistry in their pick and roll, in their pick and pop, an efficient pick and roll duo, especially earlier on in the season. So I would expect the Knicks to run it back with Julius Randle. And look, Mm -hmm. let's see what happens in in another year with those two. If they make the playoffs again, you know, last year he was beset by the by the ankle injury. He re-injured that ankle in the first round against the Cleveland Cavaliers, had some tough defensive matchups in Evan Mobley and Bam Adebayo. And so overall, his playoff performance was very lackluster. But let's see what happens in, you know, the next year, if he can make it there healthy and see if he can bounce back. But I, I don't see the Knicks moving on from Julius Randle just yet. I think they continue to run it back with uh, a Brunson and Randle ticket for the, for the time being. So then when you look at the Knicks and how they, at the moment, and I know we're far out and there's a lot that'll happen over this offseason, but right now they're odds in the Eastern Conference. In front of them are the Celtics, the Bucks, the Heat, the Sixers, and the Cavs once again. And there is a bit of a gap between the Cavs and the Knicks. The Cavs are plus 900. The Knicks are 17 to 1. Does that feel fair, or do you think the Knicks are being undervalued right now by the odds makers? 
Yeah, I wonder if the odds makers are, are thinking that last year was a little bit fluky and that, you know, maybe things just connected at the right time. But I think they are selling the Knicks a little bit short. Uh, the Knicks showed in that Cavs series that they were, by and large, the better team. The Cavs have not made any significant upgrades just yet. They have Karis LeVert, who they have to make a free agency decision on. They have Donovan Mitchell, who seems like every day he, he's dreaming about being a Nick in two years or so. So <laughs> we'll, we'll see what the future holds for the Cleveland Cavaliers. But Boston has, has not rested on their laurels after that Eastern Conference and, and, and embarrassing Eastern Conference Finals loss. They retooled with uh, picking up Kristaps Porzingis. I thought that was a big risk because they gave up their heart and soul in, in Marcus Smart. But that's saying to me, Brad Stevens is putting the onus on Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown and saying, hey, you guys are Supermax guys. You guys need to deliver. It's your team now. So we'll see what happens there. When free agency picks up, where will James Harden go? Is he going to go to Houston? Is he going to stay with Philadelphia? Yeah. Will there be cascading effects there with Joel LMB? Can Joel LMB become available if Harden goes? With the Miami Heat, I'm sure they're still waiting to see what happens with Damian Lillard. And so, mm -hmm. you know, with the Heat running it back with their current team, I wouldn't necessarily put them ahead of the Knicks either, especially the way that Miami plays through the regular season. Jimmy Butler already admitting that they don't really play at their best or play hard during that season. They kind of wait until uh, post all-star break, at least with the Knicks, you're going to know that from game one to game 82, Tom Thibodeau is going to go hard with this team. Now you want to see this team make a little bit of uh, additions. They will have $12 million in the mid-level exception to upgrade the team. So we'll see what free agents they're, they're able to bring in. And at the same time, I'm sure Leon Rose, they'll be gauging the trade market to see uh, if any stars be become available. You know, let me hit that last thing, CP. And it's been great talking to you here about the New York Knicks. But you mentioned Leon. A report yesterday that I still can't wrap my head around, that Zach Levine potentially going to the Knicks wouldn't be on the table because the Knicks favors CAA clients and Levine is represented by Clutch Sports. W what did you make of that whole thing? It's interesting, man, because at once upon a time, they were all one big happy family under the CAA umbrella. Rich Paul, yeah. LeBron James, you know, Mav Carter, the Leon Rose World Wide West, they were all one big happy family. And then Rich Paul separates and, and, and uh, starts up Clutch. But if you look at it, you look at the Knicks, most of those guys are CAA. You look at the Lakers, most of those guys are clutch sports. But I would have to think at the end of the day, the agent has to have the best interest of his client at heart. The, the client comes first. So if Zach Levine did want to trade to the Knicks, I, have, I find it hard to believe that Rich Paul would prevent that. But it's still very interesting to see the political dynamics between these two factions because there is, seems to be a little bit of smoke there. It, it certainly does, but to, to your point, CP, if Levine would be excited about being a Nick, and if the Knicks are willing to give up what it would require to bring in Zach Levine, what are they worried about treatment-wise? What, are they going to not start Zach Levine? It's a, it's a really odd, odd story. We'll see if it has any uh, downside effects there for the Knicks, but it feels like they will be busy and active this offseason, which I always appreciate, and I appreciate you, CP. CP, the franchise, follow him on Twitter, at that handle, the creator of Knicks Fan TV. Got to write in the outro. Appreciate you, CP. Kevin, have a great weekend. Thanks for having me on.